Welcome back to the channel, guys. Today we have a very different video for you. I'm sat here with a clipboard and my bike from the UCI Snow Bike World Championships 2024. That is quite a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank you all for all of your comments and well wishes going into that race and all of the comments and theatrical drama involved in the weekend and what was the aftermath. So thank you all very much for getting involved. I really appreciate the comments and I totally understand there is quite a lot of diversity around the thoughts on this race and what it involved and everything like that. And that's the reason why I wanted to sit down and talk to you about it because I don't believe there are many people actually telling you the facts. So all I can do is give you my opinions and the facts of what happened that weekend that maybe you don't know about. So where did it all start? The invitation. Now, British Cycling, we're not doing a application process to enter on behalf of British Cycling and represent Great Britain, which is fair enough. Absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. Let's make it clear, this is the first ever snow bike serious race and especially world championship that has ever been held. So therefore, I don't think it's British Cycling's responsibility to start putting together a massive team on the first year, first episode, let's say, of it. So no harm there. I phoned them up and had a conversation with several people of the British cycling team and they were nothing but amazing. Super, super helpful, super, super positive. I uh, wanted to know a bit about my background, what I've raced in, am I good enough to go and represent the country and British cycling? And obviously they came back and said yes, which I was thrilled with, absolutely thrilled. So thank you very much British cycling for allowing me to go. Now then, now it gets down to business. Most of the races that I go to have money pot prizes, they have bikes that you can win. That's how a lot of us that are in this game make a living and are able to progress in our careers. This race in particular, there was prize money. I don't know how much it was and we never found out, but that money is awarded from the UCI to the winner of the race. It doesn't actually go di directly to the winner, it goes to the cycling governing body from that participant's country. So therefore, if I'd have won, the money would have gone to British Cycling and then British Cycling, it's up to them to pass it on to me or to divvy it up if it's cost them to get there, which is a good system, I think. However, getting to the race and everything like that, that is down to the riders to do that. So that is for me to pay to get there. Um, and this is a big thing that I've noticed, a lot of people messaging me saying, how much did it cost to enter? because I think a few of you have watched a previous film we did on a urban downhill race and a lot of people want to know how much money is involved. So that's why I thought I'd touch base on this subject as well. So the race in total cost a little bit over 2,000 pounds, British sterling, for me to go there to compete and to get back home. Now, that 2,000 pounds is broken down into a various different elements where travel is obviously the number one cost and staying there, so an Airbnb. The bike obviously doesn't cost me any money, so I didn't bring that into any of those calculations. The tires, they didn't cost me anything because I'm sponsored by Schwalbe, so we did a lot of modifications and all of the equipment side of it didn't cost me anything, so that's great, but it's still 2,000 pounds to go and do this race. So that to me is a hell of a lot of money and it's worth noting. This is one thing that made me really fall in love with the Orbea Rayon. And I know that a lot of you are gonna say, oh, you're gonna say it's good because you're sponsored by Orbea. Obviously that's true, I'm not gonna deny that, but I'm gonna tell you the things that I really loved about this bike in particular at this event. The number one thing that this bike did superb on and performed better than any other trail bike that I'm aware of out there is due to the flip chip. So the flip chip is not something I've really faffed about with in the past. Um, this is an element to the bike that Orbea have told me to use because it is quite important. And in a nutshell, basically, I remove this bolt here at the back of the shock onto the linkage and you flip the chip and put the bolt back in. Now you've got two options, low or even lower. And what that does, if you imagine, if it goes even lower, it raises the back of the bike up, which in effect would drop the bottom bracket lower and slacken your head angle. 
Now that is the one thing that I really wanted to do on this race because it's a red ski run. So it's not quite a black, but it's red. It's very, very, very steep. And by slackening the head angle, I can make that bike a lot more comfortable, a lot more easy to control. And I'm not worried about losing bottom bracket height because obviously I've got no rocks flying up and hitting my pedals. So pedal striking is out the equation. So to be able to put that flip chip into the lowest possible position was a huge attribute to this bike. And it changes head angle, for example, goes from 63 to 64 and a half degrees. And the bottom bracket height was at 350. It was then dropped to 343. So we get a seven mil drop on the bottom bracket. The other reason why I really like that is I'm obviously quite tall, I'm six foot two. The lower I can get to the ground, the lower the center of gravity, the faster I can turn, the more stable I am. So that flip chip for me was the best thing about this bike for that race. I absolutely loved being able to just flip it, slacken out the head angle, drop that BB, and away we go. Now, whilst we're on the bike, let's talk about modifications because you can probably see in the camera, and I'm now gonna show you some B-roll of these tires. <laughs> And this is the sticking point for me in the race. So we're on ice, we're on snow. The UCI said, you guys, you're allowed to put spikes in your tires. Obviously no one makes spiked tires. Oh, that's a lie. Schwalbe do make a spiked tire. It's called the Ice Spiker Pro. It's not necessarily designed for racing downhill. The studs in it are very small. They're a couple of mil. Um, and that tire is designed for people that live in very, very cold countries and do a bit of mountain biking or maybe even commute to work where they might hit some ice. Now, what we needed to do is get these big screws. So this is a self tapper with a nice big sharp edge on the top of it. Um, what we needed to do was modify two tires. So as you can see here, I've got a tacky chan on the back and a Magic Mary on the front. Now, what we tried to do is go for a harder compound because if you imagine in the snow, you need the harder the compound to actually dig in. You don't want a soft tire. Soft tire is gonna obviously roll. We're not looking for roll to go around a rock and form to give you grip. We just wanted the sharpest possible thing we could do. Um, however, I also had to bear in mind that I wanted super gravity casing, so that makes the tire stronger because we're gonna be experiencing speeds that were even faster than all of the other races that we do. So we were knocking on the door for 100 kilometers an hour. So that's a lot more than we would get on a, on a traditional downhill track. What we did was spend an enormous amount of time after going to the hardware store and finding the right length screw, which by the way, on a Magic Mary, so these knobs here, work out to be give or take 10 mil if you include the carcass that you have to drill through. These screws are 16 mil. So a 16 mil screw from top to bottom should therefore give me six mil coming out of the tire, which is exactly what the UCI said we were allowed to do. Six millimeters out the tire, no problem. One spike per knob or per knobble, whatever you want to call it, knob. Are we allowed to say knob? <laughs> yeah, knob. Rules to me are paramount. Rules make the world go round, it makes sport fair, it makes life fair, and I abide by the rules at all times. I really do. Apart from when I go sideways in my car, but we're not gonna talk about that on camera. I studded the front tire, as you can see, with these lovely looking spikes, which are very, very sharp to touch. And that gives me an enormous amount of extra front end grip. I then went to do the rear tire. And as I've said, this is a, Tacky Chan. So what I didn't calculate was my 16 mil screws that I've just launched across the floor. The knobs on the Tacky Chan in the center of the Tacky Chan are actually shallower than a Magic Mary on the side knobs. So by the time I drilled through the Tacky Chan, I was then left with 6.5 mil of screw showing out. Therefore that makes my bike illegal. That is a cheating bike, I cannot do that because that gives me additional grip above everyone else. At the last minute, and this is the day before I was flying out, I realized the issue and I realized the mistake that I had made and it's no one else's fault, it's my fault because I did my calculations based on a Magic Mary. So I managed to then realize what I've done wrong and panic, absolutely panic, run to a friend's house 
borrow his angle grinder and then sit there for the next hour and a half going over every single screw to make sure that I lose the 0.5 that was making the bike illegal. Therefore, I had six mil exactly on the back and six mil on the front. So I was happy, I've got a legal bike. Whilst we're on the subject of the screws, the issue that we're now facing as cyclists, and I'm sure many of you are cyclists that are watching this, we get tire buzz. So that's where you're riding down a trail, your bum is in this position, your legs are coming up here, and on the inside of your thighs, I actually have scars, I'm not gonna show you, on the inside of my thighs, from tires over the year, tire buzzing me here. And in a worst case scenario, sometimes you take the middle of the tire to a region that you really don't want it. Now, when we think about this, that tire spinning at 100 kilometers per hour with these razor sharp spikes would be enough to, I don't even want to imagine the amount of damage. It would just, personally, I think it's a life threatening situation to have that there. A lot of you may disagree with me and that's just my opinion, but my opinion is that I have taken a tire to that region. And if you have these screws sticking out, you have then got basically a chainsaw between your legs. And I was speaking with Scott Beaumont, lovely guy, an enormous amount of credibility in the industry. He's been in the industry for just donkey's years. That's showing his age, actually. I should probably shouldn't say that. Sorry, Scott. Um, he's got numerous national titles, world, world racing. He's a fantastic human being and a huge amount of experience in the sport. He said the same as me. This is absolute ludicrous that we're allowed to do this. Now bear in mind the UCI did not say that it's obligatory to have a rear fender. A rear fender would therefore give you a bit of protection if something went wrong. So in my opinion, if this sport is to continue, you've got to have a rear mudguard or fender of some sort. A lot of people had their own homemade ones, but some of the younger riders that were racing were insisting on not having it because it didn't look cool. Now I understand we're in a industry of fashion and looking cool, but as you well know from me, I have never looked cool, I never will, and I don't really care what I look like. Safety is paramount. So having that mud guard there, I used one from Mudhugger. I love the guys at Mudhugger. I think that they make some amazing products. Who cares what it looks like? It did the job. So thank you, Mudhugger. You saved me and you saved future children. So thank you very much. So touching base on that one again, I think moving forward, it's got to be obligatory. You've got to have a mud guard there. But whilst we're still on the subject of the screws, because this is where things get a bit spicy, um, I want to make this very clear. I do not ever want to come across like a sore loser or a bad loser. But as I said earlier, fairness and equality in everything that we do is paramount. Um, and in sport, it needs to be a level playing field. It was not. And this is the reason why for me, the whole event was uh, tainted is the word I'm gonna use. Um, and that's because a lot of the riders had spikes that were grossly over six mil. One rider in particular, I'm not gonna name his name, it's not important and I don't think that's fair or professional to say his name, uh, but one rider told me openly that he had 11 mil of spike coming out and I looked at it and I agree, I'm from line of sight it looked about 11 mil, so I take his word for it. Now the UCI didn't do any scrutineering, no checks whatsoever, which I, I find very strange in a sport where there's a world title and a gold medal up for grabs. That for me is a bit strange. I don't really understand it. Maybe they've got their reasons. However, that's then amplified because after me seeing what's going on and in the race paddock and seeing the other guys, I made it clear to a UCI commissaire I am not sure what her role was, um, and I'm not sure what her name is, and that's probably a good thing because I don't think it would be fair, again, to say her name on camera. Um, I want to make this clear that the UCI all weekend were lovely, really friendly guys. However, I had a conversation with this lady and said, look, I'm here to race, I'm here to compete, that's my job as it is for everyone else. However, some guys have got double the amount of grip than others, and there's a rule there for a reason, so please can we look into it. I was faced with don't care, just don't care. She didn't care, wasn't interested in my conversation, wanted me to go away. That 
angers me a lot because, like I say, I don't want to be a bad loser, but we're in a sport, we need to have a level playing field. So the UCI massively failed, in my opinion, on that subject. Because let's face it, this snow race, it's all about grip. It's all about grip. Going down a ski run on snow and ice, it's all about grip. The person with the most grip is gonna do very well. Now, I wanna make this very clear as well. This is not a dig at the guys that have performed well because I know some in the top 10 were actually on six mil, massive credit, credit to them. And I'd also like to make a point that all of the British riders in the British team were on six mil as well. We all stuck to the rules. So appreciate all of those guys and everyone else from all the other countries that did stick to the rules. And those of you that didn't, well, that's your choice. I don't have anything personally against you. It's more of the UCI for not following up on a rule that we were supposed to adhere to. Zero practice. I can't make that, I can't even explain that enough. Zero means zero. We were told no practice, no nothing. Just rock up to the start line. You're given a random start order. I was actually, <laughs> this is random. I was given the number one plate, which I'm not gonna lie, that's pretty cool. I've got number one UCI World Championship plate. Um, so I had to go first. The day before the race, I thought, okay, I'll go up and have a look. So I'll get a pair of skis. Susie will come with me on a snowboard and we'll just ski down it, just to have a look, see if I can learn left, right, where we're we going. Because again, I think from a danger point of view, coming over a crest and not knowing, is there a, a cliff there? Is there netting there? Is it a sharp left, sharp right? You just don't know. I think that's just ludicrous. And obviously it benefits anyone that had been there before. So we took our skis up, went to have a look, and lo and behold, we were told we weren't allowed anywhere near the track. So we went down a piece that runs almost parallel to it, one of the other ones, just so I could sort of look through the hedges and get an idea, a visual of some of the turns. However, on that day, there's bikes coming down the mountain on the racetrack. So some guys, again, I'm not gonna name them, but some guys are on track or with their bike, even though we were told paramount, you're not allowed anywhere near it, let alone with a bike. Um, again, talking to the commissaires at the bottom, just not interested. They just don't care. Now I'm never gonna join them. I know a lot of people are gonna say, well, you should have done it. You should have taken your bike up there. I'm not doing that because an eye for an eye on the world will be blind. So I'm in a sport where I want a fair race. I wanna take the rule book, read it, thank you very much and crack on. And I will do that and I will always do that. I'm not changing. So if anyone wants to give it that, drop it in the comments and I will ignore you. <laughs> Now, whilst we're on the subject of scrutineering, something that I found was very strange was we were not allowed to change the frame or the wheels in between the downhill race, which was on the Saturday, and the dual slalom on the Sunday, which, fair enough, they wanna try and level it out so you can't use a downhill bike for one and then switch to your trail bike. I kind of like it. Um, I finished the downhill run on the Saturday afternoon and they decaled my bike in all these areas on the wheels. I've got all of these stickers. So clearly there is the means for having scrutineering because they were checking the bike. So why didn't they check the tires? Why didn't they check when people come down and go, crikey, look at those knives coming out your tire. Um, instead, they decided to put stickers on and care more about that. Um, again, I think that's a bit of a oversight from the UCI. And again, if they don't like my comments, well, I'm sorry, it's just my opinions. So what's the future of snow MTB riding? The truth is, I don't know. I can tell you what I think is gonna happen uh, based on what was happening in Châtel last week. There's a lot of talk about it as well. The Olympic Committee are potentially looking into it to see if this has got legs, if it's um, something that is good for the fans and good for the spectators to watch and get into. Now, I speak from the mountain bike community, any type of mountain biking that we're involved in, the chance to go to the Olympics, we should all be behind it. We should all be backing it because I believe that we're not gonna get many chances to go to the Olympics. We're really not. Our sport is not necessarily on the top agenda of the Olympic Committee and somehow, and I don't know who it is that's behind it, has got it to this far. It could be the UCI. If it is, thumbs up from me because to go to the Olympics, that would be incredible. However, I totally understand that 
there is a lot of, um, I don't know what the word is, discomfort, animosity, because a lot of riders think, well, there should be other disciplines that are there that have been around for a lot longer. And I do share your concerns and thoughts on this. However, that's not on the table. There's not a suggestion of those. So if we've got an opportunity to take our mountain bikes to the Olympics and race down a snowy mountain, my opinion is let's do it because the other options are not on the table. So that's where I stand on that. Whether it happens or not, we will see. And whether I even go or not, we will see it probably not after I've made all these comments, uh, but I genuinely mean it that I hope all of this is constructive criticism towards uh, those that have failed in their areas. Um, I don't mean it with any hatred. I just mean it from a athlete's point of view where I've gone to a race, I've had a lovely time, but I think that there could be massive improvements. I'd also like to congratulate the winners and I would like to thank everyone else that was involved in making it a very enjoyable week. Thank you very much for watching guys. I hope that the video has given you some sort of insights and information into a race that a lot of you are very keen to learn about and understand what happened. Um, thank you very much for watching. I will see you on the next video.